Shalom, this is Yair W. Spring to you from the land of Israel. I represent Britain Hebrew Awareness. Hebrew Awareness works to promote the realization of the truth that the lost ten tribes today are to be found amongst Western nations. That is what we do. We work at it. We received information when we began from others who had promoted this notion in the past. We checked the information that we had, that they gave us that we received from them. We verified it. We upgraded it. Some aspects of it we rejected. We also built upon it. We brought in new ideas, new information, new knowledge that previously had not been known to people in the West. And we, uh, we presented this. We put it all together. We showed how one piece of information interlocks with the others and we brought our proofs to the forefront of public awareness as well as we could and that is what we still do all the time we are working on it uh, looking for new information and upgraded the information that we already have and endeavouring that others should also be aware of this our sources include the Hebrew Bible rabbinical studies, mythology, archaeology, linguistics, history Anything that is something pertinent to the same the subject, we use it, we have used it, and this is what we do. One of our major breakthroughs was to identify certain peoples with Israelite tribes, with uh, certain amongst the Lost Ten tribes. There were specific tribes, and unlike Judah, the Lost Ten tribes, even though they lost their awareness of their ancestry, more or less the Lost Ten tribes remained together as cohesive units. They retain something of their tribal identity. They often retain the very names or similar names to what they had had in the land of Israel. And by uh, tracing these, we can uh, show how the, the uh, tribes remained as unitary entities that may be identified, that may be located, or traced. And uh, how they still retain the char characteristics of the tribal, of the individual tribes that they belong to, and other factors. And bringing it all together, we were able to show that where specific tribes were. Others had uh, suggested ideas along those lines in the past. Sometimes their conclusions coincided with ours. In other cases, they did not. We had our own our own understanding that we promoted in our work the tribes and this was our flag, this was our, our emblem, this was the thing, the work that brought us to the forefront and it's always been there. Recently the tribe has been sold out for, up to its fifth edition and several printings. Tribes will now be replaced with two other works, not one new work but two other work, works to other books turned, uh, that will be termed uh, Hebrew tribes and Hebrew countries. They should shortly be ready for the general public and they uh, more or less uh, repeat the message that the tribes had. They have new information and a, new, a dear, slightly different presentation to the previous one. Work. At all events, this present talk is here to give you an overall view in a nutshell and a couple of sentences of each and every tribe, who we identify it with, and uh, a couple of words concerning the proofs that we use. First of all, we proved, we showed in general that certain peoples were descended from Lost Ten Tribes. Lost Ten Tribes went to the West, and groups of peoples were descended from them. And uh, occasionally the peoples travelled and they merged with others, they brought others with them, others came alongside them. And they came in on peoples who were already there, so it's not always easy to discern who is who and who is what. So we used our criteria to sort things out. And the criteria included the blessings of scripture, that the blessings to the tribes that the Bible had used and predicted, they should have been realised to some degree. Other indications of scripture should be pertinent. Also the groundwork, the secular evidence, historical proof, psychological and related evidence and so on should show the pathways of migration from the areas of Israel and the Syrian Empire to the West. They should also have a certain affinity with the Jews. They should not be Judeophobes, not anti-Semites. 
But uh, people have always, on the whole, with exceptions, and they were taking cognizance of the historical and cultural differences, on the whole, they have not been antagonistic to the Jews. They should also have had a civilized influence on the world and have been civilized themselves, comparatively speaking, to the age they were living in. And also that they should have family connections to other groups that we have already proven to be descended from Israel. So everything taking everything together, and then we get people so we can say fairly uh, definitely are descent from tribes of Israel. And once we find these people, so we begin to identify them to correlate them with, with the specific tribes. So this is what we're going to run through now. We're using an order of progression of the description is based on the, uh, the second book, uh, chapter of the Book of Numbers where it speaks about the Israelites when they were encamped in the wilderness. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were camped in the wilderness for a long period of time, and then they would move on and then stay in the second place, in the other place for quite a while, usually. And then the tabernacle would be in the center, around the tabernacle would be the Levites, and around them, in a kind of circle, would be all the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes in uh, four groups of three. And uh, the description of the Book of Numbers begins with a section of the tribes headed by Judah, and that included Judah, it included Issachar and Zebulun. We identify Judah with the Jews, together with Benjamin and Levi, and uh, other minorities from the tribes. They all together became the Jewish people. Judah is to be identified in Scripture with the Jewish people. And numerous proofs from scripture and from other sources confirm the identification of the Jews with the Judah. This is should be obvious, it's almost laughable to be have to discuss it. But there are those who raise questions on the subject, so it's good to know that there are proofs exist proving the Jews are the same as Judah in the Bible. Prophecies concerning Judah fit the present day Jews. It was said that Judah would always be recognizable, Genesis forty nine ten. Unlike the ten tribes, Judah will always be recognizable as of Israelite descent. Judah was to keep and develop the law. See Psalms 60, verse 9, 108, verse 90, Genesis 49, 10, Zechariah 8, 19, and Zechariah 8, 23. Judah was to be persecuted as the Jews indeed were. See Zechariah 1, 15, Zechariah 8, 13, Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah 42, 10, and Psalm 44:22, The Jews would have kept the four fast lamenting the destruction of the temple. See Zechariah 8:19. Zechariah prophesied that the Jews in their places of exile, in their period of exile, would mourn, would have fast days concerning the destruction of the temple. And ever since then, there are on the Jewish calendar there are four main days that the Jew, on every year that religious on which Jewish Religious Jews fast four times a year, and Zechariah had prophesied that they would. And this is a proof that they are the Jews because it was not meant, the prophecy was not made about anybody else, and nobody else does it. On the, and uh, so, too, there are other proofs, and bring them all together, they show that the Jews are Jewish. The Jew, Judah is the Jews. The other tribe, another, the other tribe was uh, Issachar. Issachar is found among the, both the Finns and the Swiss. On a map of Europe, you see the Switzerland down here, Finland up there, but in between is Germany and the Baltic states and the non-Israelite nations. If you remove them, they're actually quite close together, and we identify both of them as belonging to the tribe of Issachar. The Finnish province of Mikali, similar to Mikhail, 1 Chronicles 7.3, one of the heads of the clans of Issachar. Also sub-clans of Issachar, Yahmi, or Yah, Yahmei, and Yibsam. They are similar, have names similar to the Finnish provinces of Kim and Uusima. And also traditions and practices of the Finns were similar to those of ancient Israel. So here we have a problem about names sounding, having a similar name but often having a different interpretation, a different explanation. So that is a way of ancient peoples, even peoples today, that peoples would bear a certain name or a certain, have a certain uh, 
connotation, a certain nickname or, no, or name that's given to him. And they would, when they come to a place of a different language or a different culture, and they would reinterpret the name that they already had in accordance to its meaning or to, or to a similar sounding expression in the language they were entering, whose vicinity they were entering into. It does not necessarily mean that they took the, that name because of the language, though in some cases it can. It's a possibility. Yusuke was described, like his brother Zibulon, as uh, being an international person. The foreigners would come to the land of Issachar, as they would come to the land of Zibulon, and they would trade with them, and they would be uh, influenced by them, according to rabbinical commentators. Uh, Issachar, like Zibulon, was to be a middleman. He was also to be uh, an intermediary. He was have to have, have a mercantile orientation, that this was more pronounced as a, with a Zebulon than Issachar. Issachar was also, was, as we said, to be a middleman, the uh, very name Issachar, connotes Sachar, reward, he was to receive wood, reward for services rendered, he was to produce wise men with an aptitude for intellectual pursuits a and a philosophical legalistic bent, together with that there would be like a donkey like they have this peasant aspect to their robust personality together with all the intellect. And uh, there was no contradiction. This Zibola, the, oh, the personality, this would all fit into the personality of Issachar. Issachar was known for having understanding of the times. He would have understanding of the times, like a Swiss watch, like Switzerland, the clockwork country. Understanding of the times. See 1 Chronicles 12, 3, 2. And Issachar was also to have uh, astronomical expertise that requires a uh, knowledge uh, of, uh, of uh, engineering and, and uh, mathematics and precision and uh, certain uh, aspects of personality that are found both amongst the Swiss and the Finnish people. Ah, the brother of Issachar was Zibulon. Zibulon is identified with the Netherlands. The symbol of Zibulon was a ship. And uh, the ship was a traditional symbol of the former Dutch Republic, which preceded the present kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, verses concerning Zebulon, it says, Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for an haven of ships. Uh, there would be a place where ships come to, where, where ships uh, make port in. Uh, and uh, Nether the Netherlands has always had this, uh, qu this quality. Rotterdam is still the second most busy port in the world and it's the busiest in Europe and is the hub of European trade because ships from all over the world come there to bring their trade and this is passed first passed on to other countries in, in the neighborhood. It also says that Zibulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea uh, that, in the, in the, that is in Genesis 49 13 in English translation to del, dwell at the haven of the sea in Hebrew it says Chof Yamin which more literally means dwell on the shores of the sea and the, the Dutch the Netherlands people in the Netherlands are the only people in the world to whom this applies about two-thirds of the population of the Netherlands is either living below the level of the sea, only slightly above it, it needs dikes and all kinds of waterworks and uh, dams and windmills and pumps and so on, and channels, and the reclamation works to protect it from the sea. And uh, the subsoil in nearly throughout the country is nearly always sea sand. The Netherlands literally lives on the shores of the sea, and it was prophesied that Zebulon would so do. Genesis 49, 13, as we said, Zebulon shall dwell on the shores of the sea, and he shall become a heaven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon, and we have shown how in West Germany and the areas adjoining the Netherlands are close to it. There are different names that uh, recall the ancient uh, city of Sidon. Sidon was a foremost Phoenician city in Lebanon. The Phoenician, the two major Phoenician cities were Zul and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon, and uh, Sidon was the senior, the senior partner of the two, the term Sidonian, someone from Sidon in uh, Homer, in the Greek writings, is 
synonymous with, with Phoenicia, that is a, a term, a generic term applied to the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were in that area, as recent studies seem to have shown, and they left their names in uh, the uh, place names recording Zidon in, in the area of Germany adjoining the Netherlands, so that it can, uh, is, that for full service in his border shall adjoin Zidon. Also in northern Frisia, that is in the region by, by the Netherlands, the region by the Netherlands, the geography of Ptolemy, 100 to 170 CE, he noted the presence of a people known as Sapalingoi. Sapalingoi. And we have to remember Sapalingoi with an S because the northern uh, peoples, for a period of time, lost the use of the, of the Z sound. They only used S or some other letters where previously they had been Zebulun. So Zebulun would, would have become Sabalin, and Goy means people. So the Sabalin Goy were literally called a name meaning people of Zebulun. They were in this region of Frisia, adjoining Jutland in Denmark, and from this area came a large number or people came to the Netherlands, and people moved from the Netherlands, from that region into the Netherlands. And they also included the people of Zebulon did the same, the Sabalin Goy did the same. The settlers of the Netherlands were known as the Sabalin Goy or people of Zebulon. And we have other proofs uh, pr uh, confirming these light uh, origins of these people. We also had in the south, in the south, first of all we had, we went from the east to the south, we're going anti-clockwise the group in the south, the three tribes in the south, were Reuben, Gad, and Simeon. Reuben, Gad, and Simeon. Reuben, we identify Reuben with France. The Rubuari Franks were important in the, in the history of France. They gave France its name, France from Frank. They were known as the Rubuari Franks. Rubuari can actually connote in Hebrew and Aramaic the sons of Reuben. The Ribuari Franks, before then, before the Franks came in, much of uh, France, especially the northern area, was controlled or settled by the Galati. The Galati were also known as Galadi. This is another form of the term Gilead. Reuben, when he was in the land of Israel, dwelt east of the Jordan in an area known as Gilead. So apparently he would, and the people who lived in that area would have been known as Galati, and so Galati is Galati, it's almost the same, and sometimes Galati was so pronounced as Galati, uh, so they still kept this name with him. And uh, so too, they have uh, other proofs concerning Reuben, uh, the sons of Reuben also gave name, names to people who settled mainly in France. The, the uh, characteristics of Reuben, the qualities of Reuben, are similar to those of the French, uh, being romantic, uh, having romantic inclinations, a uh, love of wine, and so on, uh, appreciating quality over quantity, and all these qualities uh, were applicable not only to the French, but also to Reuben, according to the commentators. Reuben was together with the Gad, we identify the Gad with the Goths and the Swedes, the term Goth, Goth, in Biblical Hebrew, can pro could probably have been pronounced as as Goth. Gad could probably have been pronounced as Goth. The the ah what we say in Gad the ah sound was actually o, oh. and the d without an accent becomes a th sound. So Gad becomes Goth. Also uh, the Gad the third name Gad place names with a Gad a uh, 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 symptomatic of Gothic settlement. So it works both ways, and either way, Gad and Goth are one and the same as far as names are concerned. Also, that when the Sweden became a kingdom, when the, the, the uh, Swia, was the name, the on, joined up with the Goths. The, the, the Sui on have a name similar to Shuni, a son of Gad. And also, other sons of Gad are also fair prominent in Scandinavian history. Uh, they have R.O.D., R.L.E. Scipion, they were all, and uh, also they were important in France. Also had the Hagi, and they were also important in, Sw in Sweden. There was some the Hagi was important in France. The Goths were also prominent in France, not only in Sweden, but the Goths settled in parts of France. 
even though their main area of settlement is the Sweden, but here too we find we find Ruben, Gad, and and also elements from the Simeon all settling in France, which uh, fits with the, the the three tribes here, Ruben, Gad, and Simeon being together in the southern section uh, that was uh, encamped around the tabernacle. We have a Simeon, Simeon. It was prophesied that Simeon would be scattered throughout all of Israel. Jacob said that maybe Simeon would be scattered, and so they were. We find a Simeon as being present amongst the Jews, amongst the Jews of Judah. Also we find uh, elements from Simeon in Ireland, in Wales, in England, in Brittany, France. And they're identified by tribal names such as Simeon, Simeon. Uh, in one case we have the Semeni in East England in the Celtic times. The Semeni were also known as Aikini. And Aikini is similar to Yachin or Yachini, who is the son of Simeon. Uh, and that is, how the, that is how the Phoenicians would have pronounced his name, or the Northern Hebrews often also had a similar form of pronunciation. So here we have Reuben, Gad and Simeon together. And we also have, have them uh, still retaining virtually the same names they had in the time of the land of Israel before they were lost. In the west we have the sections of Ephraim, Manasseh and Benjamin.